this is Susan Pakin, and you're listening to the University of Chicago Public Policy Podcast. You're listening to Root of Conflict, a podcast about violent conflict around the world and the people, societies, and policy issues it affects. In this series, you'll hear from experts and practitioners who conduct research, implement programs, and use data analysis to address some of the most pressing challenges facing our world. Root of Conflict is produced by UC3P in collaboration with the Pearson Institute for the Study and Resolution of Global Conflicts, a research institute housed within the Harris School of Public Policy at the University of Chicago. For the last several years, police violence in America has come to the forefront of public consciousness. It's an issue that can polarize the country, but for years, there lacked a data-driven analysis of police violence on a national level, and concrete policy recommendations on the issue were hard to come by. On this episode of Root of Conflict, Pearson Fellows Sonnet Frisby and Mwangi Thwita speak with Sam Sinyangwe, activist, data scientist, and co-founder of Mapping Police Violence, which is the most comprehensive database of people killed by police. Sam discusses the evidence-based approaches to measuring police violence in America and the importance of conveying the data to the public and to policymakers in a way that can affect real policy change. Sam, thank you so much for being with us today. It's great to be here. Uh, So when you spoke to us at Harris last fall, you said that your trajectory changed on August 9th, 2014, which was the day Mike Brown was shot and killed in Ferguson, Missouri. Can you tell us a bit about how you got involved with this issue and why you founded Mapping Police Violence? Sure. So, uh, you know, rewind back to 2014 in the context of the Ferguson uprising. Uh, and at that time, you know, I was working as a researcher in a research institute in Oakland, uh, focused on issues of educational inequity. So really uh, helping to support 61 federally funded communities to build out data systems that could hold all the different institutions from schools to healthcare providers to after school programs accountable to a common set of metrics and outcomes um, and results for kids and families. And, you know, as you said, my my life changed on August 9th when Mike Brown was killed because what became clear in the days and weeks and months following uh, the outpouring of uh, protesters and communities uh, outraged uh, in the in the wake of police violence, what became clear was that there was very little data uh, on the national level uh, to help us better understand Uh, where police violence is most acute in terms of which communities are most impacted, uh, which cities uh, have the highest rates of police violence, which cities have the lowest rates of police violence. Uh, And that's sort of the baseline information that's critical uh, to understanding what's working, what's not working, how you can effectively address this crisis uh, in an evidence-based way. Um, And so that's that's why I co-founded Mapping Police Violence uh, to be a database uh, now it is the most comprehensive database of people killed by police. Um, and it, the goal of the database is to track uh, every case in which somebody is killed by a police officer in the country. Um, so far, we track between 1,100 and 1,300 cases a year. Uh, we have data now for between seven and eight years of data. Um, and, and that's why I've been doing the work, because it, number one, we need the data to better understand Uh, what types of solutions can be effective in addressing the issue of police violence. Um, And we need the data to hold institutions accountable to actually uh, implementing those solutions and making sure those solutions get results. And can you tell us a bit more about how you organize such a large grassroots effort to collect uh, this amount of data? Um, What kind of logistical hurdles did you have to overcome? How did you mobilize this whole effort? Yeah, so, um, I mean, first of all, Mapping Police Violence stands on the shoulders of a a number of crowdsourced efforts um, that have emerged over the past several years uh, to try to answer this question of how many people are killed by police in America. Um, And, you know, one of the first of those initiatives was Fatal Encounters, uh, which collects, you know, at that point in 2014, there there were these two databases that existed. One was Fatal Encounters, and the other was KilledByPolice.net. Um, other than those two, the only other sources of data uh, on this issue were the federal government's data, and the federal government 
uh, only collected data on about a third of the total number of people killed by police because they were entirely dependent on uh, agencies reporting the data in a consistent and reliable way every single year across all 18,000 police agencies in America. Um, and that, that methodology was just not an effective methodology. Um, so, so fatal encounters and killed by police sort of filled that gap by just posting this spreadsheet online and updating it every single day. They had a system of Google alerts where, you know, if there was an article that had keywords like officer involved shooting or police shooting or killed by police, uh, it would identify those articles. They would then log basic information about what happened in each of those cases. So uh, the date, the age of the person, name of the person that was killed by police, a link to the article. Um, and then what, what I did was uh, merge those two databases together because neither of them had all of the records of the other, uh, and then fill in the gaps that, that neither database actually addressed. So in at that time, only about... Uh, uh, still about half of the total number of records in, in either database were not coded by race. Um, so in working with uh, looking at information in uh, obituaries and criminal records databases, information online, social media, um, we're able to fill in the gap around race. So 90% of the records in our database are now coded by race. Similarly, coding uh, for the circumstances of, of what happened. So was the person armed or unarmed? Um, and that really was you know working to find everything that was available online as well as working uh, through public records requests, getting data directly from agencies and getting data in collaboration with the volunteers and organizations across the country that were tracking what was happening in their communities uh, and putting all that in one place and then visualizing the data, analyzing it and better using it to address the crisis at hand. I'm really glad you mentioned uh, data visualizations. I mean, many of us are uh, either current policymakers or will be in the future. Um, and so, you know, we're often trying to figure out how to make visualizations that convey a really difficult point. Um, I've seen some of your visualizations. Um, you have some really, really striking ones. How have you figured out what worked? Has that been an iterative process? Uh, how do you figure out what actually impacts a policymaker? Yeah. So, I mean, first of all, just being clear about who your audience is and who, who are you trying to uh, impact or inform with your data? Um, and for me, it has been uh, not producing content that is strictly accessible only to policymakers or data scientists and researchers, uh, but rather producing content that everybody can understand that is accessible to to a mass movement. Right. I think what what's been so different about the protests in 2014 and 15 and 16 and the resulting mass movements, not only within uh, Black Lives Matter, but a number of movements that have emerged since then. Um, have been how how many people who you know weren't in, in involved in this work before suddenly got involved in the work uh, after witnessing an injustice and um, in order to leverage you know that enthusiasm that participation from uh, millions of people across the country uh, and to figure out how to translate that energy and that organizing into, into policy um, it requires producing information that is important to convince policymakers, but producing it in a format that everybody can understand and use in their own advocacy efforts, in their own local campaigns, in their own conversations uh, with policymakers and other folks in the community. Uh, and so that has been the, the goal with visualization is to make this as accessible as possible to as many people as possible um, who have now gotten involved in this work. Um, and so in terms of principles, I think first and foremost, uh, recognizing that the way that people access information today is different um, than it has been in the past. Uh, people have a lot of competing uh, influences for their time. Um, they don't have a lot of time. They are most likely getting information from social media, uh, from Facebook, uh, from Twitter. Um, they're getting the information on their phones. Um, so that means you really only have two or three seconds to hook them, to teach them something that is important uh, and can help them uh, in their own uh, understanding of the issue and then advocacy to address it. So, so that's really been uh, the goal of the visualizations is you know, to be able to reach that person who's scrolling up their timeline, has two or three seconds to interact with your content, um, mm -hmm. and to immediately teach them something about this issue in those two or three seconds. So mm -hmm. if you look at the website at mappingpoliceviolence.org, there's one uh, interactive map of the country uh, with about 1,200 different pins on that map, each one representing a person killed by police. Um, and it's actually an interactive 
uh, map that uh, flashes, it has a series of flashes that go across the map uh, that correlate with the date at which the person was killed. Um, and the purpose of the map is, is quite straightforward. It's to uh, demonstrate how widespread this issue is, how it is not limited to any one city or state, um, how this really is a national crisis that demands uh, a nationwide mobilization to address it. Yeah, and I'm one of those people. I, I follow you on Twitter. Well, I, I checked yesterday, and I think you have 173,000 followers. So, um, you know, in merging activism and, and data science, um, it's clearly important for you to, to make your research accessible and usable and actionable as well. I wanted to ask you more about this intersection between activism and data science. Um, with um, the group, you were talking about Black Lives Matter with, with groups like those uh, which have created a, a movement that's brought the issue of, of police vi violence to the forefront of, of our national consciousness. Um, do you think more needs to be done for these groups uh, and their efforts to be coalesced into, into institutions and a policy agenda? You know, I think the, the challenge with this particular issue is that uh, there is not one federal standard for policing. There's not one uh, federal police agency that if you just change policy in that one agency or even at that one level of government, you know, if, if Congress passes a bill, um, it's just not going to be sufficient to change policing outcomes in all 18,000 departments across the country, each with their own policies and practices and outcomes uh, and leadership. And so necessarily in order to, to get to change at scale, it's going to require uh, equipping people and organizations and initiatives in as many of those jurisdictions as possible with the tools and the resources and the, uh, the analyses that it will take them to actually change policy locally. Um, and that will affect the trend line at the nationwide level. Uh, we haven't yet seen, you know, as you sort of alluded to, um, we haven't yet seen change uh, in, in terms of substantially reducing the number of people killed by police nationwide. Um, the trend line has remained relatively constant every single year. It was uh, between 1,100 and 1,300 people killed by police in 2013, the year before the protests. Uh, it was uh, about that many people. Uh, about 1,100 people killed by police in 2019. But what we have seen um, are a couple of things that we didn't know five or six years ago that we know now that are helpful um, in thinking about how to address this moving forward. So first and foremost, uh, we know more about what doesn't work. Um, so we know that some of the initial ideas and proposals uh, that were pretty popular in 2014 and 15 um, have been implemented in many places, have been studied, and have not achieved the desired result in many of those jurisdictions. So things like body cameras, uh, there was an incredible randomized control trial looking at body cameras in Washington, D.C., the largest ever such study looking at body cameras. They found no impact on reducing police use of force. Uh, so, so that wasn't a, a solution. Uh, similarly, you know, implicit bias training is something that's being implemented in de police departments across the country. Um, we have yet to see research showing that it actually changes police behavior. Um, at, uh, at the same time, because now we have the data and we're tracking these outcomes and we're tracking what policies are being passed and what impact those policies are not having, um, we've identified things that do work. Uh, changing police use of force policies, making them more restrictive, uh, requiring de-escalation, banning shooting at moving vehicles, uh, restricting deadly force to only be uh, authorized as a last resort after officers have exhausted all other alternatives available to them. Those policy changes actually substantially reduce police violence, and we've been tracking that. Uh, I mean, you look at the largest cities in the country, uh, many of which implemented these policies. Uh, among the 30 largest cities in the country, police shootings have dropped 40 percent uh, since the protests began. Uh, and that's huge, right? 40 percent is a huge mm -hmm. number of people um, who are alive today that would not be alive if not for uh, reforms that have been implemented. And those reforms occurred because of the protests, because of the pressure, uh, because of the research, because of all of those things coming together uh, and impacting policy uh, at the local level and in some places, even at the state level. Um, you look at places like California and they've changed their deadly force standard uh, in part based on the research that we've produced linking use of force policies to use of force outcomes in terms of killings by police. Um, so, so all of that matters. All of that is making an impact in the places that have begun to implement those changes. Uh, the problem is, you know, again, this is just a, a massive scale issue. Um, there are a whole bunch of smaller police departments across the country that have just simply not 
changed at all. If anything, their outcomes have gotten worse. So if you look at suburban and rural communities, uh, rates of police violence are actually going up as they're going down in the cities.